Hello, everyone. I'm Jared Wong, and along with Adi Jokke, Babington, Ashaye, and Ruchi Gill, co-chair the 2020 Annual Meeting of the American Society of International Law. On behalf of the Society, we warmly welcome you to the first of two late-breaking panels on the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's panel will consider the promise and challenges for global governance during the pandemic, whereas the second panel, taking place exactly a week from today, will seek to understand the disparate impact of the pandemic on marginalized communities against the backdrop of protests raging against police brutality across the globe. These two late-breaking sessions are a preview of the annual meeting on June 25th and 26th, which will feature over 150 speakers drawn from every corner of the international law community. The theme of this year's annual meeting is the promise of international law. More than ever in these challenging times, we all hope for and need international law to live up to its noble promise. Without further ado, I'm turning over this session to Professor Lawrence Gostin, who is the Linda D. and Timothy J. O'Neill Professor of Global Health Law and the Faculty Director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University Law Center. He also directs the World Health Organization Collaborating Center on National and Global Health Law, and we are hard pressed to think of anyone better to moderate this panel. Larry? Thanks very much, Jared. I appreciate it very much. Um, and I uh, join you in uh, welcoming our audience um, for uh, this uh, late breaking ASOL um, session. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking at the value of international law and international institutions, and also good governance, you know, in the United States, Europe, uh, East Asia, and now Africa, um, and uh, Latin America, and virtually all over the world. Um, let me start um, with the SARS um, epidemic, because SARS was, you know, a major coronavirus epidemic. Pandemic. And following um, SARS, uh, the World Health Organization revised the international health regulations, um, which is the governing instrument um, for uh, uh, handling um, pandemics. Uh, then after the West African um, Ebola uh, epidemic, um, which Beth was, from the United States point of view, very central in, uh, the uh, there were a number of um, uh, after action reports. I was a member of several of those commissions, um, which recommended considerable reform of the World Health Organization's um, response um, uh, and including uh, suggesting that the World Health Organization um, launch a, a, a health emergencies program and a health contingency fund. I think, John Luca, you were there. It's, as counsel um, at uh, WHO at that time. And so we've had a very um, changing uh, landscape of law and also strengthening the core institution, which is the, the WHO, um, in responding for, to outbreaks. Um, and we've seen that you know, you know, put into play in for things like you know, MERS, another uh, coronavirus. Um, and we've also seen it, um, it more recently uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where the World Health Organization has been working with the DRC um, to put out um, an Ebola uh, outbreak, um, which has been going on for a long time, just as it was coming to a close, of course. There was another um, outbreak in the DRC that's thought to be unrelated. Um, that's going on now. But this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been an enormous stress test, a uh, stress test for the World Health Organization, uh, for the international health regulations, and frankly, for governments around the world. Um, I was, uh, I'm on the Global Health Board of the National Academy of Sciences, and you know, one of the things we've been discussing 
is how we can evaluate all of the different responses in the world. You know, we can see um, beginning in China with a major lockdown that we thought was unprecedented, but then we've seen um, uh, repeated uh, in many parts of the world, including uh, uh, app-based te technology with tracing. Um, but we've seen countries that were um, more liberal democracies like um, South Korea, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, um, deal with this without major lockdowns um, and, but traditional public health responses like um, widespread testing, contact tracing, isolation, uh, and quarantine as, as a method. And now we're seeing um, population-based mitigation tools like um, universal wearing of, wearing of masks, social distancing, um, uh, remote learning, remote um, uh, uh, working. Um, and so really the world has changed in unprecedented ways, in ways that we could barely have imagined. Um, I know my father actually um, grew up uh, when he was about uh, three years old um, in the great influenza pandemic of 1918. I always wondered what that was like, never thought that I would see it. And now you might even hear her occasionally, my three-year-old granddaughter is here and she's living through the COVID-19 pandemic. And so uh, the world comes full circle, but I think all, all of us on this panel, Sharifra, Gianluca, Beth and I have been saying for years that we don't know, you know when the next pandemic will come. We don't know what the microbe will be, um, but we know it's coming and we need to prepare. And so here we're going to be uh, talking about how we prepare as nations, but also as an international community, because we're all in this together and we really do uh, need to find a common um, set of languages, a common set of actions um, that we can all um, uh, rely on. So I'm going to um, introduce the panel in the order in which they're going to present. Each one will speak for five minutes and then we'll have a, an active discussion. Uh, first will be uh, John Luca Berchi. Um, he is uh, an adjunct professor at the international, of international law at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, and also directs with me uh, the joint LLM a Global Health Program with the O'Neill Institute. Um, He's, uh, as I mentioned, former legal counsel um, for the World Health Organization uh, for 10 years. Um, he's you know, the world's leading authority on uh, uh, global health law and international law and institutions. Um, next um, uh, will be uh, Sharifa Sakakala. Um, she is the um, associate professor at the University of Warwick in the UK. Um, she currently specializes in global health law and equity, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. I've worked with Sharifa um, quite a lot. She's a brilliant mind, a, an innovative thinker, um, uh, a, uh, a young leader that we're going to turn to over and over again as we try to think about how we deal with this and future pandemics. Um, and then fi finally, but definitely not least, um, is Beth Cameron. Um, uh, Beth uh, uh, has become a dear friend, um, but she's known to everyone in the United States uh, and globally in, in our area. Um, she is at um, NTI's Vice President for Global Biological Policy and Programs. And prior to joining NTI, um, she served as the Senior Director for Global Health Security and biodefense um, in the White House National Security Council. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Beth was responsible for so many um, of the innovative programs of President Obama um, during his years of global health leadership and leadership um, more generally. Um, I should also mention that the, um, uh, she was instrumental with the global health security agenda and now working with um, partners. She's been um, uh, leading in a, uh, something on uh, 
trying to evaluate how we have a global health security index and to see how well nations are prepared. Um, so we have a great panel. John Luca, may I turn it over to you, please? Thank you, thank you, many thanks, Larry, for this great introduction, and thank you to Jared for for inviting me. Um, so five to ten minutes is little more than a soundbite, so let me jump right in. Um, Jared uh, reminded us that the theme of this session is uh, the promise of international law. So that title must have been chosen before COVID-19, because <laughs> frankly, COVID-19 has not been the greatest news for a lot of international legal regimes and international uh, institutions. It actually showed the vulnerability there, the weakness and how vulnerable we are to nationalistic, inward-looking leadership. At the same time, uh, every crisis is an opportunity. And so we have to look at the promise, even uh, in a rather tragic state in which the world is now. And that's what I, I will try to do, to see uh, if there is some optimism and how we can improve at least the first line of defense um, against these health events that consists in, uh, in the international health regulations and in, 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 the, in the work of WHO as the custodian and manager of the, of the regulation. Sharifa will talk about more uh, specifically about WHO. I will cover more a little bit the international health regulations. So COVID obviously goes way beyond health. It has overwhelmed many uh, of the aspects of our, of, our, of our life as an international community, from finance to investments, to aviation, to trade, to human rights, and so on. But it is still essentially a health event. And so we need to go back to, as I said, the first line of defense. And the first line of legal defense can continue to be the international health regulation. That is the latest iteration of a long history of cooperation to prevent the spread of epidemics. Um, what are the main obligations for states and how do we frame what should happen in the future? Fundamentally, three sets of obligations. The first is what we call core capacities. So the states should have a health system able to resist the shock of a pandemic, but in particular to prevent it and contain it and offer inclusive, equitable uh, health care to the victims. And so, and this is interesting because health system are seen as something fundamentally domestic, but actually they are in, of international concern seeing what happened. The second set of obligation, which is actually what China was uh, criticized for not honoring, has to do with transparency, good faith, uh, cooperation and due diligence in assessing health events, in cooperating with WHO, in passing information and so on. And the third is restraint in national measures. You, you shouldn't adopt arbitrary measures, but your measures should be based on the risk assessment, be proportional, be necessary, and be limited so as not to interfere unnecessarily with human rights, with trade, and so on. WHO is a supportive role, an important role, but supportive. Everybody's criticizing WHO now, but the main actors are states, don't let's forget that. So WHO um, tries to coordinate to surveillance with a dynamic dialogue with states, providing analysis, information, guidance, and alert. You remember the famous public health emergency. So COVID has shown a bit the limits of this design and the limits in implementation, both for states and, and WHO. But I don't think it undermines the fundamental design and the fundamental philosophy of an instrument that tries to globalize risk, try to see risk as a global issue in the, in the, in the 21st century. The main problem has been clearly the chronic underinvestment and the lack of preparedness in national health system. And I hope it's a wake up call because if we don't fix that, nothing else will work. The second is a lack of accountability and the weakness in oversight functions. So the states don't have a particular incentive in complying with the IHR, neither do they have strong deterrence in case they breach them. And the third has been clearly late responses, uncoordinated, reflexively nationalistic and inward looking, beggar thy neighbors kind of response. And we see where we are. I think from a rational choice perspective, they've shown the weakness. So what should be changed? I think the main priority should be to move the action to the earliest possible time. If you try to act in a raging pandemic, you lost your chance. And so it has to be both WHO and states have to be uh, to focus. If you see a flash is a tail on my cat <laughs> who is walking on the table, the delight of working at home. Um, so early action. The second is creating incentives and deterrence. And the second have a, an integrated response, where health actually is integrated in a broader response. So 
in the substance, what should happen? The first is to um, increase preparedness. And here states must take the lead uh, at all levels of development. You don't have to have uh, to be a developed state. So having a better resilient um, health system that tries to uh, exploit its strength and minimize its weaknesses. The second is uh, to change the system of alert that now relies only on, on, on emergency. It has to be much more granular and gradual to allow WHO to kick in much earlier than when we have an emergency. The third is to increase accountability, include a system of compliance assessment that now is missing. There is no assessment of state's compliance with their obligations. And the fourth is strengthen WHO surveillance and alert powers to be able to second guess states. Easier said than done, and I don't think the states will volunteer to have this higher level of scrutiny. But if we don't do that, we go back to what we had in January with all the misunderstanding and recriminations. And finally, to have an integrated system. It, a health response doesn't work if you kill trade, if you kill human rights, if you stop everything, if you have a disproportionate response. And to do that, WHO cannot go it alone. You need to establish a some kind of coordinated framework that includes the, the, state, the stakeholders, that includes the various international organizations, but crucially, that leaves a, a space for states to coordinate, to compare risk assessment, to do mutual learning, to try to uh, at least to consult on how to minimize disruptions. Alin Taylor, a colleague of mine, and Rugina Bibi have just published a ASO Insight, so uh, staying in the house, where they, they, they propose something similar to UNAIDS like a co-sponsor UN pandemic kind of system that tries to combine the various sectors, but also leaves crucially a space for politics, for state to sit together and try to coordinate um, what they should do. So this is in a, in a nutshell how I would see the promise of international law in the sense of how the IHR could be strengthened. It will not be a magic bullet, but certainly it should improve the situation from, from what happened now. I will stop at that. Many thanks, Larry. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me turn it over to you, Sharifa, please. Um, and then uh, we'll, Beth will be our final speaker. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Larry. And thank you for the, uh, to the ESO for having this breakout session. I think it's a really important uh, topic to discuss. So um, if my paper were, if this were a paper, I think it would be kind of, what 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 WHO do we want? And I think that this is a really important question to ask ourselves. In some ways, the crisis enables us to ask this question of what do we want global health governance to look like? So the WHO already has a lot of power to govern global health crisis. Uh, it has the power under the WHO constitution, which gives it a coordinating function and as John Lucas talked about under the IHR, it has those powers as well. It has powers to come up with treaties. Uh, it has had that for a couple of years and has successfully completed several international treaties. But I think that in built in its design has always been uh, conundrums or tension. So on the one hand, we have a scientific organization that we want to give us the science but on the other hand, we also want a governance institution. And I think that those two things, we must find a better way of reconciling them in times of crisis. Because at the moment we are expecting the scientific, uh, the scientific part of the organization to not behave like science. We want our science to be certain. We want it to be not complex. We want it to be quick and easy. And this is not what science is. So it seems to me that we're asking an organization that we ask to be scientific to do unscientific work because we're asking it to govern. And I think that we need to really think about what that needs, uh, what that necessitates. We're already having this conversation at the domestic level in many countries. In the UK, for instance, the scientists have accused politicians of politicizing the science and vice versa because you have this sense where people want certainty, but actually sometimes the science is not certain and we have to re recognize that. And so it leads me to questions of, so if we have this organization that's both scientific, but also a governance institution, 
what are our three options? And in some ways, um, we've already started to see this. So states could withdraw, but if they withdraw, then to what? We still need a, go a global health institution that does global health governance. So there have been some suggestions that we could have a new institution. We could have something like the Global Fund uh, that comes up and helps to deal with, I don't know, COVID-19, or in some ways, the Global Fund expands and then does global health governance. And I think that this is unsatisfactory. So the Global Fund is a financing institution. It has a very limited mandate. And as we see, it also has problems. So it's not a problem for institutions. So it's very easy to think of a crisis and think, let's sort it by starting a new institution and that will solve the problem. So as we've seen with the problems of replenishment, that governments are quite reluctant sometimes to live up to their commitments, even within the global fund. And that's something that we should consider that a new organization is not going to be a magic bullet that solves our problems. The second model which has been suggested is uh, the joint program model that I think John Luca talked about that was suggested by Alin Taylor and Jean Habibi. And here we create special programs in which we put all COVID related stuff in and we think this is an organization that comes up with coordination and helps us to kind of solve the complexity of COVID-19. And that on, on the face of it seems persuasive. It seems like something that we could do quite easily but I think it still doesn't solve the fundamental problems of global health governance. It's not going to get us there. So if you look at AIDS, for instance, and you look at how uh, UNAIDS started, it started within the WHO, it left the WHO and became a separate institution. And that's something that we need to take seriously that that could happen again. And do we really want to have a COVID-19 institution as well in order to kind of further fragment global health governance as we have it? Because that's also one of the major things that we must think about, that if we have global health governance, we need to be united and we need to have solidarity. So we do not want to have a situation whereby you have one institution that is dealing with one, just one infectious uh, disease and lots of other institutions that are doing different things. But also I think that the idea of joint programs does not fundamentally deal with the fact that actually the WHO does not just deal with infectious diseases. So I do lots of work on Sub-Saharan Africa and the bulk of the work that the WHO does in Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of capacity, in terms of training, in terms of technical expertise is not on infectious diseases. It's really on thinking about what the right to health is as a, a, a core uh, requirement for global health. And so that's something that we really need to take seriously when we think about this notion of fragmenting, of fragmenting global health. The last thing might be to think about some sort of reform and John Luca has uh, very nicely helped to think about the kinds of reform we should have for the IHR. But I think one of the things that should underlie any kind of reform when we're thinking about the WHO is to think about how essential it is not only in order to give that technical expertise, but also the long, experience that it has had in dealing with many global health crises uh, from the eradication of um, the, er the eradication of smallpox from dealing with polio. And I think we really do not want to lose that. We really want to enhance that and think about that expertise, that scientific expertise uh, in terms of outbreak and response, the capacities it has, but, but also the coordination of global networks that it has. And so that might be something to think about as we go forward in terms of thinking about the WHO and reform, that it has this expertise that we don't want to lose and therefore it's something fundamentally worth keeping as we go on uh, post COVID-19. So I'll stop there, Larry, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, appreciated, well done. Um, Beth, you're on next. Thanks very much, Larry. Thanks to the organizers and to my co-panelists, Gianluca and Sharifa. It's a pleasure to be with you. 
Um, I am not a legal expert, but I, I do dabble in governance with a lowercase g. And I think um, actually tying together some of the things that Jean-Luca and Sharifa just said um, will really be my task is to hopefully spur some conversation um, on our panel. So I just want to make a couple of, of points and also talk a little bit about the U.S. experience and, you know, bluntly what's happening in the U.S. with our inward look and our walk back from some of these global institutions that are so important, including the World Health Organization. So the, the first point, um, and both Jean-Luca and Sharifa have made it in different ways, is that COVID-19 has uncovered major gaps in our national and global governance for preparedness and response to pandemic threats in every country, um, certainly in my own country, but I think around the world. And also it's uncovered equally that now more than ever, we need solutions, real solutions for global governance and pandemic preparedness and response. And I do think that means strengthening, uh, not walking away from the World Health Organization and the international health regulations. But I think it does bear stressing that um, in this venue when there are questions about those things internationally. I think we also do still need informal arrangements like the global health security agenda where people can put more forward leaning ideas on the table, kick them around and then work them into the fabric of our institutions to strengthen them and sustain them over time, but not as a replacement to those institutions. I think that's absolutely critical and important to say. Um, I think it's also now more than ever important to stress how important the WHO is. In our response to COVID-19, the fact that the WHO is providing tests and protective gear, promoting research and development, clinical trials coordination, they're enabling external assessments of country capability through the joint external evaluations, which are part of the monitoring and evaluation framework of the IHR. These things are vital functions of the WHO, and I think that not every country sort of values those functions until we find ourselves in the event that we're living through now with COVID-19, we realized how important these functions were all along and we look backwards about where there might be flaws or problems in the architecture um, when really we should have been strengthening that architecture, anticipating those failures and working to plug the gaps all along. So I think um, we also um, really need to recognize um, that the WHO is critical for coordinating um, the response in ways that are vital in low-income countries, but also critical for countries in, in, in middle and upper income levels to include the United States. I think it's not very clear to many people in the United States why we need WHO and thinking about ways to talk about these legal frameworks and these global institutions. Um, I think we need some, some better ideas about how to make it clear to the world um, that these institutions are vital, even though they need to be strengthened. So Larry also asked me to reflect just a little bit on the US experience and response to WHO in light of the IHR and, and, the, um, and the WHO and what's happening in our country now. And just very bluntly, you know, the United States is one of the countries among a few that really took a very inward fo focused look um, when we when we um, found ourselves, you know, with cases of COVID-19. We looked inwardly for our responses. We did not look outwardly. We did not use the institutions that we had available to us, including the WHO, including the G7, which we're the president of this year, including the G20, including the UN Security Council. Um, there really haven't there have really been major challenges in all of those um, normally used mechanisms um, to promote um, a, a stronger response. And where the U.S. usually takes a strong leadership role, um, those things have really been very challenging for us because we have not taken that role. Um, and the result um, in our country is really um, a, a very challenging response with greater than 20,000 cases per day, over 100,000 deaths. And we're watching partners around the world um, in countries like the Republic of Korea, for example, who have done you know, a much better job. So we are in a tough spot in the United States. And I think now more than ever, we need to be looking outwardly at partners who have been able to, uh, to control this virus uh, better than we have. And we need to be working with the WHO. So what yeah. happened in the US and how does this relate to leadership and governance and why is it relevant for this session? I think it's important as we look at capability and as we look at strengthening the IHR and strengthening the capabilities around the world to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats, we need to also look at local governance and leadership um, and figure out ways um, to measure that, that oversight for capabilities that we have. And so an example 
um, that Larry mentioned, and he works with uh, my organization on, on this as part of um, a panel to inform our effort. Um, our Global Health Security Index looks at 195 countries, and the United States scored at the top of that capability index. It didn't get a perfect score. It got a B. I wouldn't call that a great score. We did get a great score, and that a, a relatively great score compared to other countries, because we have capability. We didn't leverage that capability, because we didn't have leadership in place that was able to quickly le leverage that capability. And so we are now looking back as we look towards the next iteration of the index to think about metrics for governance in countries, including um, bolstering our already existing metrics in public confidence in government, where the United States actually did not get a very strong score. Also including factors, other factors of political socioeconomic risk that play a great role in how countries um, deal with pandemics. And I think looking at how, um, how much we need leadership and governance um, internally in our own countries also uh, further strengthens um, our argument for working with international institutions that can step in or should be able to step in when other mechanisms fail. So I'll just um, end quickly by reflecting on you know, what next. And a lot of my points are really going to echo many of the things that John Lucas said, but I think they bear repeating. And I'll just make a couple of points that are specific to the WHO and then a few that are more broadly about governance um, in the face of pandemics. So with the WHO, the work that they have on health security and health systems um, more broadly is vital. Uh, we absolutely need to have the WHO continue to play that role, but we also need um, ways to show accountability and oversight within countries for building their preparedness for meeting the IHR. And I think that's where um, you know, the work that went into developing the joint external evaluations, which is a monitoring and evalu piece of the monitoring and evaluation framework, um, which um, over 100 countries have undergone an external evaluation of capability. That's wonderful. All countries should do it. And I think the WHO should be more forward leaning in its stance um, to, towards countries that have not done that and more forward leaning in talking about the results and the need for every country to have done that, that assessment. I also like these ideas for an oversight board or some sort of mechanism within the UN itself for greater accountability. I think the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board is a really great start in thinking about how to strengthen that function. This is a group that is um, co-led by the World Bank and the WHO. Um, for those of you uh, listening who aren't familiar with it, it's, and it, it, has, um, it has the intent to provide oversight and accountability, but um, I think that function could really be stronger. I also think that we could use um, a permanent facilitator for high consequence biological threats in the UN, in the office of the Secretary General, not to take the place of the WHO, but to really constantly be, um, be in looking at what is emerging, including being able to knit together um, strands between the WHO and other UN agencies with a role to play, like the UN Office of Disarmament, affairs when we're dealing um, in the future someday, hopefully not, but maybe with a deliberate biological event. I think we do need to take a hard look at the IHR and the monitoring and evaluation framework with an eye towards strengthening the information sharing pieces of that. Um, there's been a lot said about who knew what, where, and when with respect to um, COVID-19. And I think really bolstering partnerships between countries so that information is shared as quickly as possible um, is a core uh, element of the IHR. And it's something that really the WHO and an apolitical body really needs to lead and, and be forward leaning about. Um, we also need to be looking at other elements outside of the WHO in partnership with the WHO. Governance for our global supply chain, which is really failing um, low resource countries, including in Africa, but also failing developed countries. Um, and developed countries are then competing with low income countries. That's unfortunately happening around the world. We need a better disease uh, surveillance network, um, working with WHO to share information more quickly. Um, and I think that we also need a global health security challenge fund of some sort, whether it's with or at the World Bank or as a separate function. It shouldn't replace the WHO's uh, strong work on health systems preparedness, but it absolutely, I think, is needed in order to um, build the political will for countries to put health security and pandemic preparedness into their budgets. So I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, I think that we should all around the world be exercising for these kinds of pandemics so that it's not just us talking about them you know, every few years and then coming together, unfortunately, um, in the face of something as disastrous as COVID-19. 
I think that's another role that WHO can and does continue to play and could be doing even more um, to strengthen that, that element of the IHR. So I'll stop there. I put a lot on the table in hopes that it gives us a lot to talk about. Thanks. Thanks very much, Beth. And yeah, it, uh, all three of your talks give us so much to talk about. I mean, we've, we've covered um, uh, issues of, you know, what is the WHO we want from Sharifa and, and how, how could that institution work? And her view, which I strongly share that we don't wanna have a workaround with another institution we want to strengthen WHO, uh, John Luca uh, talked about the governing framework, the international health regulations. We might also um, talk about web, about virus sharing and whether the PIP framework um, uh, could be uh, improved or enhanced. Um, Beth uh, talked about really um, national governance, health systems strengthening, but also how that interacts with international. Um, organizations. And so I've got a lot of questions. Why don't we start with accountability? Because um, both uh, John Luca and Beth um, uh, talked about accountability. And of course, you know, one of the issues is, you know, uh, which entity is accountable um, and for what and to who? Um, and so I think in John Luca's case, he was talking about accountability and correct me if I'm wrong, John Luca, accountability of governments you know, to, to live by their um, uh, agreements uh, under the international health regulations, the WHO constitution. Um, you know, Beth was talking about a larger set of accountability frameworks that the World Bank, I know Jim Kim had initiated that. Um, so let's start with governments. Um, yes, we all want governments to be accountable, um, but we all see that sovereignty is as strong now as it has ever been in international law. And in fact, you know, beyond sovereignty, there's, you know, hyper-nationalism and populism um, that really is very much country first. Um, so how do, you, how do you get accountability of governments? How, what changes in, in terms of incentives and compliance um, would you suggest? John Luca, they break the ice. Yeah, um, for you first. <laughs> um, good question. Um, and obviously, the fact that something is a legal obligation doesn't necessarily sell itself automatically. Um, as I said, I mean, I think uh, there should be a um, working on both incentives and deterrence. Beth talked about a fund, and that's something that came out in the various evaluation after Ebola. Uh, that countries, uh, developing countries and so on, sometimes are at the receiving end of anything that happens from this point of view. And so it can be, it's a deterrent to compliance, uh, to coming out clean if they have a, um, a sort of a, an outbreak of disease on the hands, or they are those that suffer the biggest consequences with ripple effect uh, up the ladder of, the, of development. So some kind of financial mechanism. As you know, the, the World Bank, as Ebola established the, this pandemic emergency facility, but until now it's not worked very much. And it's a very complex mechanism. It implies that already you had the beginning of a pandemic or at least of, a, of, a, of an outbreak at hand. So the, there are many, many possible permutations and I don't think we have the, the time and the space here, but I think there's some kind of financial buffer would be, would be important as an incentive. You need deterrence also. Uh, many people have been talking about naming and shaming uh, that is absent in the case of the IHR because that is clearly, at least within the framework of WHO, uh, it doesn't work that way. There is no finger pointing, at least from the Secretariat, even within the Health Assembly, there is no granularity on the level of compliance, so you don't have the the basic data uh, to quantify and articulate the level of compliance. That's why I, I emphasize the need to have a system of compliance assessment, which is more integrated in the IHR. Beth talked about the this joint external evaluation that have been quite successful. Uh, and that's a good example. But if you think of it, it's something that happens outside the IHR because it's a voluntary mechanism that was created uh, through um, 
originated its global health security agenda, so even outside of the WHO framework, and then imported in. And that's a good mechanism. And if everybody will 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 uh, play by that, you have a um, a common basis for assessment, uh, and that can be a deterrent towards no compliance when it comes to core capacities. Um, and then um, finally, if you look at international relations theory, I am a big constructivist. Uh, I do believe that states um, engage in mutual learning, they change their, uh, the, the view of themselves and the view of their other so social interactions. And that's why I, I really feel strongly that we need this kind of um, joint mechanism where states meet in a non-confrontational manner uh, and literally exchange their experiences, compare what they've done. And I, I think that would be a powerful mechanism to increase uh, collective and, and individual accountability. So th these are some ideas. Yeah, thank you. There, there are so many things I would like to follow up on. In fact, what the first question we got from our audience was about the, uh, the World Bank's pandemic emergency financing facility, and it was basically saying, you know, the concern is that money comes too slowly um, and uh, seems less salient now than it's ever been. Um, uh, so, but I wanna bring in some of our other panelists. Um, one of the things you said, uh, Sharifa, that really struck me um, is a really pertinent question, which is, you know, what is the World Health Organization we want I've put it in some of my writings uh, in, in kind of a, a more um, flip side of that, which is, you know, you know the, world, the world has the WHO it deserves. That is, it doesn't support it politically, it doesn't support it, you know, funding wise. And so, you know, why would, he, why would we expect something different if we don't support it? But tell us, what, what is the World Health Organization we want and how can we get it? <laughs> if only just, a little, just a little tiny question. Uh, it's only a tiny question. So I, I've been, I was thinking when John Luca was speaking, I was thinking, what about people? So, okay, there is hyperpopulism, but the WHO managed to have the biggest fundraising that it had ever had from individuals. And I think actually that's amazing. And we should in some ways think, what, what do people want? Is there a way of democratizing the international institutions to make the people who are very young, who are thinking about these institutions, who are not jaded, uh, like all of you are thinking, this is what you deserve, rethink and reimagine what these institutions could be, and then push their governments to behave differently. And I think international organizations haven't done that so much. We've uh, thought of organizations as kind of a meta level, but there is another level of re-engaging with the institutions that I think we could do a bit more of in terms of radically rethinking what they're there for and how ordinary citizens can engage both not only with these organizations, but engage with their governments in order to push for change within them. Yeah, I mean, one can, UNICEF has a lot of you know, popular support. And, you know, and I know in the United States and Africa and other places, um, civil society pushes for the global fund, um, but WHO doesn't have that support. I remember giving a talk in South Africa and I, you know, during the AIDS epidemic and everybody is wearing their in your face t-shirts about AIDS. And so I put on my World Health Organization t-shirt and I was actually booed. Um, because it was an intergovernmental organization thought to be very remote. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, I am beginning to see a little bit of the signs of this bottom-up uh, mobilization in favor of WHO. It would be great to see. Um, Beth, I want to turn over to you now because um, there was one thing you said that, um, I, that was jaw-dropping and so important. Uh, which is you said that, you know, yes, in, in, in the Global Health Security Index, uh, the United States scored highest. Um, yes, it was only a B, but it was still the highest. Um, but then you said that, um, you know, capacity is one thing, but leadership is another. Um, and that how do, you, how do you unleash that capacity? And so if you think about um, 
what uh, John Luca was talking about with the joint external evaluation and what the, the Global Health Security Index is trying to do, which is build up health systems. But what we can do about leadership or governance, you know, what, what do we do um, about, you know, I'm just going to be very frank here, um, the Bolsonaros, uh, the, the Trumps, um, you know, and to a certain different extent, the Xi Jinping's where, you know, they're kind of, you know, blaming and, you know, punching each other and always being inward looking. How do we get that kind of leadership? I mean, I, I can't think of anybody in the world who I would want to ask that question more of than you, because you actually did that um, during the Obama uh, era with Zika, Ebola, et cetera. Another really easy question, Larry. <laughs> no, no, I'm, <laughs> no. I, I'm happy to take a stab at it and welcome thoughts from the other panelists as well, because I think it's a really important one, and I think it does also get us back to what we need from the WHO, because we can't. We need a, a WHO and an international system that can withstand um, the President Trumps of the world who walk away from institutions. We they have. We need an institution that can withstand that. Um, and I think a couple of things. So first, within the context of WHO, um, I have found over the years, and I am not a WHO expert the way that, that um, Jean-Luca um, and Sharifa both are in my career, like, or like you, Larry, where I've studied it you know, academically as well as um, worked with it personally. But most of our international institutions are reticent to sort of take a leadership role. They often do, even when they are clearly in the lead, um, they often do take their cues from leaders. And, and they, they often feel they have to because they won't get supported if they don't because the stakes are so high for making a mistake. Um, and, and we see that playing out right now with COVID-19. But I do think that we need a WHO that can clearly state what it needs and what it wants. And we need a WHO that isn't afraid to compare countries and not to compare them for purposes of naming and shaming, but to compare them with incentives in mind. What is it that you need to get prepared because you're not able to do this core function that you should be able to do as a government? Um, I find WHO to be reticent to take the leadership role that it could take, recognizing it can't do everything that the world thinks it can do within the context of the IHR. And I've, I've reread the annex in preparing for this discussion, and I know what WHO can and can't do legally. But WHO does have a platform that's really important, and it can be taking, I think, a louder leadership role in some of these cases in telling leaders uh, what they need to see and what they don't. In terms of looking at what countries like the United States can do in the absence of strong leadership, um, the public has a, and our state system have a really strong role to play. And I've been very encouraged by watching what our governors, for example, are doing. But I really like what Sharifa said about uh, the public and young, the next generation, who are going to have grown up looking at this pandemic as a core piece of their of their you know, loss of educational opportunity in some cases, formative moments for people going into public health. And I think we actually have a critical moment to shape what the next generation wants to see in leadership and to make public health not just about public health. And the last thing I'll say, Larry, is I've been in so many meetings with public health leaders who are frustrated to see national security leaders at the table. And I try to be really deferential about that because I was trained first as a biologist and second in national security. But I think that WHO has to embrace um, and the world um, public health system has to embrace um, leaders from foreign affairs and heads of state coming into this mix. I think a UN summit like the one that the Secretary General and Tedros are planning for next year on biological threats regularly to push towards specific actions, commitments, financing to help low income countries, that would be awesome. But it needs to continue and it needs to be in support of ministers of health, but it can't be led only by ministers of health. And so I'd like to see um, the public health community embrace leadership from outside of public health in order to help public health. Yeah, I mean, the, the role of, you know, WHO is, is an inherently political organization, but it doesn't have the kind of political muscle and it needs, uh, it needs uh, the UN, it needs uh, support by the, the G7, the G20, 
uh, and these other kind of governance functions, I think is critically important. But it needs um, to show its relevance too. It needs to be really clear about what it brings to the table and loud about it. It does, you know, and I want, I was gonna wonder if John Luca would like to comment on some of the things that Beth was saying in terms of, you know, what, you know, that WHO should, you know, stand up, be, be more directive, more, more, more of a leadership role, you know, to say, you know, what kind of government governance arrangements do work best, you know, and push back a little. Um, you know, what, yeah, what? Let, let's say eternal dilemma concerning international organizations. On the one hand, we go by the functionalist theory that being created by states to serve states. On the other hand, they often become a more autonomous, independent organizations, depending on the political space, depending by the by leadership also. Uh, the, 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 the WHO, Dr. Brundtland, that was not the same as WHO of other director generals. So there are many factors that can leave a space uh, for leadership. Uh, leadership can, and can, can be expressed in many different ways. I personally think that Dr. Tedros is doing a good job and he's exercising leadership. He I stays on message. He doesn't pick up. Sorry? Hmm? I agree. I did not mean to imply otherwise. No, 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 no of course. But uh, just to. to to, to give my, my, my take on what leadership can, can mean. Um, he stays on message, he's taken the moral leadership, don't politicize the pandemic, we need unity, we need solidarity, we are saving lives. That's a good kind of leadership. And I read the newspaper and what he says comes uh, pretty regularly on the front pages of major newspapers. So the media captures it and it comes to the attention of people. But I, I, I really agree with one thing that Beth said concerning the role of the United Nations. Because like it or not, uh, WHO is still seen as a public health niche. It doesn't have, as you said, Larry, the traction, the political leverage to lead on things that go beyond, uh, clearly beyond public health. And it's not a coincidence that so many health issues have moved to New York, to the, to the General Assembly, to the Security Council, HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, universal health coverage, antimicrobial resistance, no communicable diseases. When things go beyond a level of complexity, which beyond, if you want, the, the, the niche of public health, they migrate from WHO, at least at the point of view of the big policy directions. So I think you need more leadership by the UN. The UN, paradoxically, has basically no health expertise. When they do something health-related, it's always WHO that gives the input, and then WHO that participates in the implementation. But I, I would welcome uh, a, a sort of building of health capacity and health analysis capacity in the United Nations, because to me, it can play a role of political direction that the WHO simply cannot play. Yeah, um, I wanted to, to pivot a little bit now because a lot of our discussion has about, been about high politics um, and you know, strong, uh, you know, powerful uh, governments, uh, and including even on the UN Security Council, um, I know General Assembly is much more uh, democratic, but um, Sharifa, um, you're a specialist in uh, Sub-Saharan African uh, health um, uh, issues. And uh, now we see um, COVID, you know, it began um, in China, powerful country, it went to East Asia, many powerful countries like you know, South Korea, Japan, um, Singapore, and others. Then it went to, to Europe, and then the United States, and that captured a lot of the air, you know, took, took the air out of it. But now it's, you know, we're, we're thinking about this in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and other parts of the world, um, where traditionally WHO has had its comparative advantage. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, how we should think about COVID as it's moving to low and middle income countries. So thanks, Larry. I think that that's a good question in some ways because it hasn't. So the publicity on sub-Saharan Africa, on Africa generally, has just been really poor. It's been either it's going to be awful or everybody can't cope or and there's just lack the nuance of the everyday coping of what is different within this context. And in some ways, the continent was quite prepared. Lots of sub-Saharan African countries had had Ebola before. They had a good record of track and trace. 
so they could trace people quite easily. You had quite a lot of mobilization of resources from the international organizations such as the IMF and the World Bank in terms of helping people to cope. But I think that there were spaces I think that we have missed of thinking about, for instance, the human rights implications of lockdowns within a sub-Saharan African context are quite different from the lockdown implications within a European context. And I think it's that kind of thing that we really need to amplify and talk about more. So you had lots of, lots more women, for instance, dying because they can't get to hospitals because of lockdown situations. And I think that context really matters. The WHO has had strong, the WHO Africa has been quite strong. And I think that it could have done better in amplifying some of those wider human rights issues than it has done before, as opposed to thinking about human, the way in which uh, lockdown as being a very homogeneous uh, way of responding to the crisis, which I think is what has happened uh, within the context of Sub-Saharan Africa. Thanks, really. That, that was terrific. And I'm glad you raised the human rights issues because we haven't done that yet. And we have to remember that's part of international law. And we have to try to think through you know, what these trade-offs mean in terms of public health, human rights. Uh, I think it's critically important. I'm gonna um, pivot to another um, human rights equity question um, uh, that was asked by our audience. Um, and it's a really great one. Just assuming a vaccine against uh, SARS-2 uh, has uh, been developed, what could, should the role of the World Health Organization be with regard to the fair distribution of vaccine among states? And this raises the question, you know, is WHO the right uh, body for that kind of action? Um, what, what do we do about this kind of power competition over a vaccine. It's, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's taken on political, economic, political and economic uh, implications, almost like the race to the moon. Um, it's a really, um, and there's every possibility that we might not see the equitable distribution. So let's talk a little bit about global health equity um, and particularly relating to a vaccine. Uh, which one of our panelists would like to jump in first? If not, I'll have to call on you. <laughs> John, look, it was about WHO, so why don't you start, um, and then we'll um, see if others can join in. Uh, first of all, there's no easy solution, in particular on the down... Um, on the on the on the on the on the downhill side, because if you want, we have on a on a on an upward uh, trajectory. We are still engaged in research and development, uh, and there I think we've seen a, quite a change um, in what could have been. Uh, WHO was at the center of the conversation, both as a con convener of, of meetings, uh, as a platform for scientific exchange, which are all, all together quite successful and so on. So, in that sense. Uh, it's reason for some optimism. Uh, states have committed funds, have committed themselves to um, equitable access even when we have antivirals and vaccines. Um, major pharmaceutical companies have seen the writing on the wall and as have rushed to say that they will supply at cost, that they will not enforce the patents and so on. So we see a lot of good intentions and some action. But you're right, I mean, when we have a vaccine, then the situation changes, then obviously, and I think if I were a political leader, an elected leader, even the most democratic and outward looking in the world, I'm accountable to my population. Uh, that doesn't mean that I want to starve the rest of the world, but you do have, I think, good faith and legitimate uh, uh, governance dilemmas in what equitable uh, access to a to a countermeasure like a vaccine is. So that requires a uh, obviously enlightened national leadership, which doesn't seem to be in in 
in, in uh, ample supply nowadays, but it also requires, again, a kind of ongoing uh, multilateral conversation. I think WHO obviously doesn't have any power to, 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 to sort of oblige, to coerce anybody to do anything. So it can be, again, a convener, it can be um, a catalyst for a conversation, it can play an operational role. Don't forget what happened during the H1N1 uh, pandemic. Uh, obviously, once the uh, developed countries have satisfied their own needs, and especially since the uh, gravity of the influenza started decreasing, generosity kicked in. And so they wanted WHO to act like a broker to start uh, distributing vaccines to developing countries. It didn't go very far because, again, the gravity of the disease wasn't what we expected it to be. But we have a precedent where WHO stepped in between and solicited donation, transfer of technology, and so on, and acted as a sort of channel uh, to uh, distribute vaccine uh, to developing countries. The problem will be the scale because the whole world will want a vaccine. And we have very few countries and very few companies that can manufacture vaccine. So there will be a huge undersupply problem. Uh, and there too, I think there will be a need for a, for, a, for a conversation that will inevitably involve WHO and where WHO can exercise the kind of soft leadership that I was talking about before. But I think it would be an illusion to think that it could do more than that. Beth, you, uh, you may have been in the White House during H1N1. Um, you weren't. Um, the, um, <clears throat> but as somebody in government, <clears throat> um, how do you deal with the uh, the dilemma that John Luca talked about, that is, we envisage scarcity of something that has enormous health, social, and economic impact for your country and for the world. Um, if you if you're in a position to, of scarcity, do you um, satisfy your own population fully and completely first, and then worry about equity? Or do you worry about equity earlier on? I think you have to be thinking about equity earlier on. I think it really will depend on the disease, right? And where we, where, I mean, I think the situation we find ourselves in with, with SARS-CoV-2 is bad, but I can imagine worse, as you well know, from what I work on on a regular basis. And what I mean is that there is some, there's not perfect clarity, but there is some clarity about who is most affected, what age ranges are most affected, people with underlying medical conditions. So I, I do think that countries will have to figure out how to satisfy vulnerable populations really early on, but I think that should be done to the best extent possible, factoring in global, global vulnerable populations. I think it's a really challenging question that can only really be resolved by thinking through what the production capacity is in any given country for any given vaccine. And the same is true for personal protective equipment, by the way, it's an analogous problem where we have a scarce resource, same for testing reagents and tests in general. And I think we do have to start thinking as a forward look um, about how we can manufacture these things at scale or pivot production capability to manufacture at scale in more places around the world, not just in specific developed countries or all developed countries, but regionally. Because the other problem that we have is getting things from point A to point B, and we're seeing diagnostic testing capacity not getting to the African continent. John Nkengasong has been talking about that this for Africa CDC, and I've been speaking with them about some of the mechanisms they're putting in place for pulled purchasing arrangements. We need to be thinking about that and those types of activities much earlier. But to get back to your extraordinarily challenging question, Larry, I think that there should be arrangements where we're looking at percent donation um, of vaccines produced in developed countries very early on, because I, I don't see, especially with COVID-19, the situation with 7 billion people, um, how we're going to do this um, in a let's vaccinate one country at a time kind of manner. I just, I don't think it works. I also don't think it's safest or more, most secure for any individual country to view it that way because we're connected. It's not like we're operating in, in isolation from one another. And at some point, we are all gonna turn back on our air travel. It's, you know, it's gonna happen. It's already starting to happen. So um, that's my answer. There's no perfect solution. I was definitely involved in conversations in government about how much we would donate and what our, you know, what our, um, our rubric would be working with WHO. I think we need a lot more of that collaboration right now to get to an equitably distributed vaccine.
Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that we, we need to work on two fronts. I mean, one is to, um, uh, to, to amplify manufacturing um, so that we get to a point we're always going to have scarcity, but if we can have more ample supplies, that will help. And so I think we need to bring in, you know, um, not just the traditional um, Western uh, vaccine manufacturers. I'm thinking of places like India that's played, you know, a very large role. And we probably are going to probably see and need more than one um, COVID vaccine. We're going to need um, a number. And we've got, uh, over, WHO recently reported, 130, more than 130 vaccine candidates. Three of them have already passed phase one clinical trials. Unfortunately, they're in China, US, and the UK, um, and not um, uh, more in, in other low, in low and middle income countries. Okay, let me, the next question from the audience um, um, is for you, Sharifa. Uh, it basically says that you mentioned that you want to strive for what, what the WHO and other internationals could do, could be. We're coming back to that again. But it's the question is, does the structure of international law allow for that? Does sovereignty prevent big change to institutional, uh, in, uh, to in, international institutions in their leadership roles? And particularly for intergovernmental organizations like the World Health Organization. So yeah, so I think that that's a great question, but I think in some ways um, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic. So I think that uh, the crisis has made me feel optimistic and I'm thinking kind of 1945, it was bad and we got a great set of international organizations and we started thinking globally about the things that we could do. We managed to set up the WHO, we managed to eradicate disease, we managed to, uh, start getting rid of malaria in lots of places. And so I think that there is that there's, there is going to be a huge pushback for sovereignty. But also I think there's the limitations of sovereignty right now. It hasn't really gotten us very far in the height of a pandemic. Everybody was still struck really badly. And the kind of the most of the country that still had a B still has over kind of 100,000 100, deaths. And so I think that there are those limitations in terms of what people think is possible at the moment. And I think that I'm just a bit more optimistic about international organizations, more, more optimistic than I have ever been. But I don't know whether you are, Larry. <laughs> you look very as you look great. <laughs> You know, I'm, 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 I'm smiling because that's a, you know, a lovely optimism to have. Um, we've only got um, you know, a little more than five minutes left. So I want, you know, the, another question was, uh, according to international law, is it possible to talk about a legal obligation to assist um, developing countries? It's something I know John Luke and I have talked about a lot uh, in our group. Um, and, but I want to uh, raise that to a larger level and ask any of the panelists uh, to, uh, uh, to respond to this, or maybe all of you. Um, Sharifa's comments reminded me of it. That's why I was smiling. You know, it's, you, know you, you mentioned you know, when we formed the World Health Organization as the first international agency of the UN. Um, and it all came, all of that, amazing activity come, came after the war. There was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the WHO Constitution, um, the, the UN itself. Uh, it was an incredible period of change. And so I wonder, you know, right now, um, it's, it's easy to see COVID as, you know, we're blaming one another, we're fragmenting, we're falling apart. Uh, countries, are, you know, nationalism is surging. Um, but I wonder, you know, can we can we make an, an once in a lifetime opportunity out of this crisis? Um, and if we could, what would be? I'll ask each panelist to say what would be the one thing um, that you, the one truly transformative thing that you would like this crisis um, to um, uh, to emerge from? You know, to 
to that we could achieve. And I'll just go in the same order as I started. So why don't I start with you, Gianluca, go to Sarifa, and then to um, Beth. To Thank you, Larry. You like big questions, and it would finish uh, Remembering with the big questions. Five minutes. Yeah, um, so I'm less optimistic than, than Sharifa. I think the situation now is different from 1945. I think we had so many things, the globalization, we had the intention of inequalities, we have a disenchantment with politics, we have many things that um, I think will be harder to, to overtake. At the same time, and I, that's what I would like to, 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 to leave as a response to your question, we have a revenge of big government. In, a, in an era of dogma, of small government, leave it to the market and so on, the government came to be the provider of public goods of healthcare, of emergency care, of trillions of dollars in, 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 in to save economies and so on. So in a way, we have the comeback of the government as an essential uh, provider of, of public goods and also as the uh, owner of big powers, also power constraints and so on. So to me, is there is a an opportunity coming out of this is precisely in this, in rediscovering the state, um, as a uh, fundamental um, element in, in security, uh, with limitations of sovereignty, but also with the assertion of sovereignty, sovereignty which is functional to satisfy fundamental needs and rights of people. So I hope that that's a, a message that, 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 that's a highly optimistic, but uh, if we just get this kind of reflection, I think it would be a, a great achievement. And many thanks again, you've been a great moderator. Like. Thank you very much. Uh, my, my one takeaway is universal health coverage, and that's kind of as a global thing. So universal health coverage has been thought about as something that sub-Saharan Africa needs. But what we saw with COVID-19 is that everybody needs universal health coverage, and we need it now. We need to start thinking about what it means to have true universal health coverage, how many doctors we need, how essential they are, how we provide them with equipment, how we provide the beds that we need, how we provide people with vaccination programs. And I think that we that's the one takeaway that I think that should come out of COVID-19. Yeah, well, that's what Dr. Tejo said, all roads lead to universal health coverage. Beth, um, you're our final um, speaker. And then I'll okay. sum up. Thanks, Larry, and thanks to both of my co-panelists. This has been phenomenal. I'll just say, um, so I agree with what Gianluca and Sharifa have both said. I would also, what I hope to see come out of this is some truly transformative leaders who can take all of the energy. So I'm with Sharifa, I'm optimistic because I've seen the energy um, coming up from youth that are now interested in this topic. And I would like to see some light that is shed on all the problems in a positive way that bends sunflowers towards it so that we can do something transformative in the way that the UN was created in the 1940s. I do think we can do it. We just need leaders. So I'm hopeful. The one thing I'd like to see is, um, is you know, transformative leaders actually taking advantage of this opportunity. I agree about universal health coverage and also would like to see a pandemic preparedness financing fund as part of it. I gave you three, Larry, sorry. No, that's great. And I think we've got a consensus around uh, government's responsibility to provide universal health coverage. Uh, we know that. Um, I'm just gonna give, throw in my wish list if you don't mind. Uh, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to get the WHO we really do deserve, um, to really strengthen it, to, to give it the kind of core functioning and powers and political support um, that 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 uh, that we need, and um, so I would I would love to see the world rally around the WHO um, when 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 we come out of this. Um, but let me just um, end by thanking you all. What an incredible panel! Um, I don't think ASIL could have chosen three more brilliant, experienced, uh, thoughtful um, people. Um, who uh, care so much as we all do about the world. You know, we're, we're experiencing something none of us have ever experienced in our lifetimes. Um, and it's been truly sobering, you know, the effects on health, um, mental health, uh, economics, 
it's it's revealed um, horrible um, inequalities, racial, national, economic inequalities um, that have, have been horrific. And it reminds me, and I'll just end with um, the great Martin Luther King, you know, he said that inequity is, you know, is a horrible thing, but of all the inequities, health inequities is the most unconscionable. So thank you all, our panelists. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, ASIL. Um, and it's been a terrific conversation. And uh, stay safe out there. Take care. Many thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you all.